You see, that's what a creature like Mr. Evans does. Appears without, appears, yeah. No, it's okay. okay. We're still rolling, it's okay. fine. You see, that's what a creature like Mr. Evans does. Appears out of nowhere and suddenly poisons the whole atmosphere in the house. God forgive him, the bastard. See that? See that? God forgive me. And if you knew your prayers as well as you knew them old pagan songs. She's right. I am a righteous bitch. You work hard at your job. You try to keep the home together. And you perform your duties as best you can because you know and you believe in responsibilities and obligations and good order. And then suddenly you see that hair cracks are appearing everywhere, that the control is slipping away, and that the whole thing is so fragile that it can't be held together any longer, and that it's all about to collapse. And then there's that, there's, there's that Sweeney boy, the boy from the back hills, the boy that was anointed, well, his, his trousers didn't catch on fire, like Rosie said. No, they were doing some devilish thing with a goat. Something for, for a sacrifice for the Lunaza festival. And Sweeney, he was so drunk that he toppled into the fire, the bonfire. But I don't even know why that came into my head. And Mr. Evans, he's going to be gone for another 12 months. And next week, or the week after that, Christina will collapse into one of her depressions. You remember last winter, all that sobbing and lamenting through the night. I don't think I could go through that again. And then the doctor says that Father Jack's mind is not, not confused, no. He said that probably his superiors had no choice but to send him home. But what does that mean, Maggie? And the parish priest, he came and talked to me today. And he said that the numbers in the school are fallen and I probably wouldn't have a job next summer. But Maggie, the numbers aren't fallen. So why is he telling me lies? Why does he want me rid? Why does he want to rid of me? And, and if he does give me the push, all five of us will be at home together all day long. And then we can spend the whole day just dancing to Marconi. But you know, what worries me most is Rose. If I died, if, if I lost my job and the house became broken, what would become of our Rosie? There is no nobility in poverty. I have been a rich man, and I have been a poor man, and I choose rich every fucking time. Because when I have to deal with my problems, I show up in the back of a limo, wearing a $2,000 suit and a $40,000 gold fucking watch. And if any of you think I'm superficial or materialistic, go get a job at fucking McDonald's, because that's where you fucking belong! But before you depart this room full of winners, I want you to take a good look at everybody around you. Because one of these days, you guys are going to be pulling up next to each other. And they're going to be pulling up in their brand new Porsche. Their beautiful wife, who's got big voluptuous tits. And what are you going to be doing? You're going to be pulling up in some beat up pinnum, sitting next to some fucking wildebeest who's got three days of razor stubble and a car full of groceries from the fucking price club. That's who you're going to be sitting next to. So you listen here and you listen good. Are you behind on your credit card bills? Good. Pick up the phone and start dialing. Is your landlord ready to evict you? Good. Pick up the phone and start dialing. Does your girlfriend think you're a fucking worthless loser? Good. Pick up the phone and start dialing. I want you to deal with your problems by becoming rich. And that means something to who? You had a career, Dad, before the third comic book movie. Before people forgot who was inside that bird costume. 
You're doing a play that is based on a book written 60 years ago for a thousand rich old white people whose only real concern is where they're gonna have their cake and coffee when it's over. <laughs> Nobody gives a shit but you. <laughs> and let's face it, Dad. Oh, you're not doing this for the sake of art. You're doing this because you want to feel relevant again. Well, guess what? There's an entire world out there full of people who fight to be relevant every single day and you act like they don't exist. <laughs> Things are happening in a place that you ignore. A place that, by the way, has already forgotten about you. <laughs> I mean, who the fuck are you? You hate bloggers. You mock Twitter. <laughs> you don't even have a Facebook page. You're the one that doesn't exist. Let's just face it, you're doing this because you're scared to death, like the rest of us, that you don't matter. And you know what? You're right. You don't. You don't fucking matter! I feel like I'm in the wrong world. Because I don't belong in a world where we don't end up together. I don't. There are parallel universes out there where we just didn't happen. Where I was with you and you were with me and that's the one where my heart lives in. You know, I wanted so badly to go back into that dream the other night. I tried, I tried so hard to go back to sleep. You know, I never thought love was real. I didn't. But now I think Life isn't real without it. And I know that sounds like some bad greeting card or whatever. But it's so stupid. It's so irrational. Why am I so hell-bent on getting you back? You fucking hate Pixar movies for crying out loud. I don't want to be with a person like that. Why does it feel so impossible to let you go? It's an addiction. That's what it is. It's a biological addiction. If you think about it, all relationships are narcissistic because you're just looking for somebody to love you as much as you love yourself. That's all it is. No. No, that's not true. I don't know anything anymore. But I do know I love you. Come in, come in, take a seat. It'll be quick. <laughs> oh yeah, thank you. I love this character too. You know, him and I have something in common. It's our rage. Um, great girl, isn't she? Yeah, she told me what you did. Um, and let me put it this way. You are absolutely lucky I'm not tearing you apart right now. I'm 250 pounds full of muscle, trained in various forms of martial arts, armed and unarmed. And well, frankly, when this conversation is done, I want you out of my face and out of our lives. I don't want to see you. I don't want to hear your name. And if I feel we're in the same zip code and I just happen to see you down the street, well, well, let me put it this way. The fast car in the garage, it has a really big trunk. Um, you can go now. Oh, and uh, happy Halloween. Al Steele, my late husband, made this company. And I was by his side, sharing the burdens and the joy. You think you're very clever, don't you? Trying to sweep the poor widow under the carpet. Well, think again. I am on the board of directors of this company, and I intend to stay with it. Al and I build Pepsi to what it is today. And you are trying to tank me. You assume that I would not want to be on the board. Al and I built the company to what it is today, and I intend to stay with it. You appreciate my contribution and devotion. Yet, you're releasing me from the board Al built this company, and I intend to stay with it. You drove him to his grave, 
and now you're going to stab me in the back? Forget it. I fought worse monsters than you in Hollywood. I can win the hard way. You say you don't want any hard feelings. You don't know what hard is until I come out publicly against your product. You'll see how much you sell. <laughs> Threats that surely I don't mean? Don't fuck with me, fellas. This ain't my first time at the rodeo. You forget the press I brought to Pepsi was my power. And I can use it any way I want. It's a sword that cuts both ways. The board has doesn't seem to realize the extent of my interest in the company. I think you misjudged me, and I'm happy that you're pleased that I stay on. Thank you, gentlemen. Now let's get to work. Ever been violated? Anyone rape you lately? Let me tell you how it feels. You know in those made-for-TV movies, when the woman's crouched down in the shower, sobbing, holding her knees, because every time she closes her eyes, she still feels where he grabbed her. When they show the attack, her eyes go all blank and still as her, play, her mind takes her to some place so she can get away from the horror of what's happening to her while some Lilith Fair song played. Well, it's nothing like that. He's sturdy and sweaty and licks your face and wipes himself off in your hair. And when you try to scream, he punches you so hard. You see God. And when he comes at you again, he reaps stuff you didn't even know you had because he enjoyed himself so much the first time. I know you want to help me but if helping me means that everyone's going to look at me the way you're looking at me right now, do not help me. Water, earth, air, fire. My grandmother used to tell me stories about the old days, a time of peace when the avatar kept balance to the water tribe Earth Kingdom, Fire Nation, and Air Nomads. But then everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. Only the Avatar, master of all four elements, only he can stop the ruthless firebenders. But when the world needed him most, he vanished. A hundred years has passed by, and the Fire Nation nearly victory in war. Two years ago, my father, a man of my tribe, journey to the Earth Kingdom to help fight against the Fire Nation, leaving me and my brother to defend our tribe. Some people believe that the Avatar was never reborn into the Air Nomads, but I still haven't lost hope. I believe that the Avatar is still there and saved the world. <laughs>